Hello and welcome. I'm Joy Williamson Lott, Dean of the University of Washington's Graduate School, home of the Office of Public Lectures. I want to thank you for joining us for tonight's Graduate School Public Lecture entitled Sexually Speaking, An Evening with Dr. Ruth. This evening's moderator will be UW's very own Dr. Pepper Schwartz. Before we begin, I want to acknowledge the Population Health Initiative, our talented live stream production team, and graduate school staff who helped make this live stream possible. Thank you. I also want to thank you for your continued loyalty as viewers of these great live streams. We know it's not the same experience as what our in-person lectures offered. One day we will be able to see one another in person and I know our Office of Public Lectures team is really looking forward to that. Now a little bit about tonight's event. Dr. Ruth Westheimer may be best known for having pioneered talking explicitly about sex on radio and television, but as it turns out, that is only a very small part of her rich and diversified life. Born in Germany in 1928, Dr. Westheimer was sent to Switzerland at the age of 10 to escape the Holocaust, which wiped out her entire immediate family. At the age of 17, she went to then Palestine. She later moved to Paris to study at the Sorbonne and in 1956 went to the US where she obtained her master's degree in sociology from the graduate faculty of the New School of Social Research and Doctorate of Education in the Interdisciplinary Study of the Family from Columbia University Teachers College. Her work at Planned Parenthood led her to study human sexuality under Dr. Helen Singer Kaplan at New York Hospital Cornell University Medical Center, where she became an adjunct associate professor. Subsequently, she taught courses at various institutions of higher learning, including Princeton and Yale. She currently teaches at Columbia's Teachers College and Hunter College, and she continues to lecture worldwide. She's the author of 44 books, including Stay or Go and Roller Coaster Grandma, and she's the executive producer of five documentaries. She has her own webpage, drruth.com, and can be found on Twitter at AskDrRuth. Our moderator, Dr. Pepper Schwartz, is a professor of sociology at the University of Washington. She received her BA and MA from Washington University in St. Louis and her PhD from Yale University. She is past president of the Society for the Scientific Study of Sexualities and past president of the Pacific Sociological Association. The American Sociological Association has given her the award for public understanding of sexuality and the Simon and Gagnon Award for Distinguished Work on Sexualities. She is the author of 25 books and over 50 academic articles. She was the Love, Sex, and Relationship Ambassador for the AARP for over a decade, and for the past seven years has appeared as a relationship expert on the Lifetime television program, Married at First Sight. Thank you for joining us tonight and enjoy the show. Hello, I'm Dr. Pepper Schwartz, and it is my mate, great privilege and pleasure to introduce Dr. Ruth Westheimer. This is a woman, of course, who needs no introduction because amazingly, she is well known and beloved from people who are 20, as well as octogenarians and everybody in between. Ruth has an incredible life and I'm not going to be able to do it justice because I want her to answer your questions, but I do want to say a few things about her that weren't in the first introduction. First of all, though you'd never know it, she's 92 and a half.
technology. Um, I want to talk just a few minutes about Dr. Ruth's dynamic presence as a sex educator, as a role model, with her work and leading with her very clear presence in the school of health care. And Ruth, let me tell you something that Ruth did for me that I think is probably equally important to her leadership style. She said to me, Uh, Ruth's latest book is called The Doctor Is In. She also teaches a graduate course now in the Changing Family in Columbia University. She's getting a very good education and she's doing a terrific job at her work in the field. She has a formal approach to her teaching. Book, which is about the Jewish tradition um, of sexuality, of seeing it. Um, in particular, in the classic part, the Christian part, All right, I'm so sorry for the technical difficulties, but I am going to take the last slide and read it.
I used to be a kindergarten teacher and um, it made a lot of sense uh, to me to start worrying about the relationship and about family life because as, as you have heard, uh, I was an orphan uh, from the age of 10 and a half when I was sent with a kinder transport to Switzerland. And that's how I was saved from the Nazis while my entire family uh, did not make it. So it made sense for me because my grandmother said, I'm so short, you should be a kindergarten teacher because you could fit on those little chairs. So this made a lot of sense to me. I studied to be a kindergarten teacher and I really, Frost, can you hear me? Okay, I really have to tell you that by starting to be a kindergarten teacher was very important in terms of my later interest in being um, a sex therapist and a relationship uh, therapist. Because once I was a kindergarten teacher, I could see the importance of the family on education. Let me give you an example. I did a study of following 50 children who left Germany in 1939, just before the outbreak of World War II with me, who all of them became orphans because the parents were not able to leave Nazi Germany. And I did a study which showed the importance for all of you who are interested in education, the importance of early socialization, the importance of my having been in a loving family, an only child until the age of 10 and a half, and also the other children that I studied. None of those children, 50 of us, who became orphans, who then went on many to the United States, many to then Palestine, like myself, and very important, none of them committed suicide. None of them became like um, emotionally uh, problematic or with big psychological problems because the early years of their childhood were in a loving family, so the early socialization was successful, which carried us on through a whole lifetime. So when I can talk to you out there, a thousand four hundred of you, I can smile because I was able uh, to raise, I have two children, I have four grandchildren, I have a son-in-law, a daughter-in-law, and I'm a very fortunate person. Now let's see if uh, Pepe can get me another question. If not, you ask the question, uh, Frost, Frost. I never knew that I would be a sex therapist. And I do know Pepper for many, many years. And um, we, have, uh, we have a lot of friends in common. And I thought that this part of my being so interested in issues of sexuality had also something to do with my having had no family. And I was very fortunate. I did a big study, which then became my doctoral dissertation with my doctoral advisor, David Goslin, whom Pepper also knows and is friends with. I did that because I worked for Planned Parenthood of New York City. 
I ran a project training paraprofessionals to be family planning advisors and to go and tell people about Planned Parenthood at a time when not so many people were openly discussing it. And this project became my doctoral dissertation. Then I realized to be a sex educator wasn't enough. I really wanted to also uh, be a counselor for people with problems in, in terms of sexuality. How fortunate I, fortunate I was to be accepted by Dr. Helen Singer Kaplan, who was the first, the very first a psychiatrist and um, uh, MD, a, a, a medical doctor, to be a wonderful trainer, a wonderful role model. And I was working with her for seven years. First two years being trained, and then I stayed five more years to help train others at Cornell Medical School. And Dr. Helen Singer Kaplan, wrote the first book on sex therapy. Very important. And uh, I have her also in the documentary that was just mentioned, Ask Dr. Ruth. I have Dr. Helen Singer Kaplan explaining that for women uh, to uh, have orgasms, uh, it's important for them to masturbate. One second. It's important for them to masturbate. Nobody at that time talked about masturbation. It is important for women, she said, to know their body in order to be able to teach their partners how they have to be um, stimulated in order to be orgasmic. It's very interesting because uh, Helen Singer Kaplan had all of those qualifications to be that first sex therapist. And the whole group of us were really fortunate to learn from her. Nobody at that time uh, spoke so openly on television um, about it's difficult for young people to realize of how revolutionary that was to be able to teach women what to do in order to teach their partners how to have an orgasm. So um, first, I, I want to say a few more things about that. Lately, some very interesting topics came up. For example, people used to worry about the G-spot, the Grafenberg spot because Dr. Grafenberg, he said that inside the vagina, that there is a spot, if properly stimulated, will bring about a fantastic kind of an orgasm. For years, for years, first, I've been saying to everybody, and now I'm saying it to 1,400 people here, don't look for that Grafenberg spot. We don't know if there is a G spot. And lately, I said, we need a scientifically validated study about if there is such a thing. I didn't say there is no such thing because I didn't have the data. Lately, Cosmopolitan magazine did a survey. It's not a scientifically validated study, but a tremendous survey. All of you get that Cosmopolitan a magazine a couple of months ago. First, you'll find which month it is, and then you let everybody know. And that survey said, no such thing. So I could say to all of you, stop looking for that Grafenberg G-spot. It might not even be there. It's very interesting because that was part of what people like Pepper, and other sex therapists have been doing by educating, uh, by being sexually literate, by educating 
that it's all right to talk and teach, even on television, even on Zoom, even on a snowy night from New York about good sex. For example, I'll give you another example for men. When I started to have a private practice and I started to uh, treat sexual dysfunction, there were many men who were what is called premature ejaculators. They ejaculated faster than they want to. People like myself and other sex therapists were able to teach them what to do in terms of first masturbating themselves, stopping before ejaculation in order to recognize that moment before it is too late, before the ejaculation. These days, I don't hear so much anymore about premature ejaculation. I also, because of people like Pepe and all of the other sex educators and therapists, I don't hear so much anymore about people not being able to, women, to have an orgasm. Let me give you an, another example why it is so important to be sexually literate, why we are talking about it on Zoom. These days, girls menstruate at an earlier and earlier age. We don't know yet why. Some people say because of nutrition, but we don't know really why. However, very important, all of you 1400 public lecture listeners, very important that every girl must know about menstruation so, so that she doesn't menstruate in school, going to the bathroom, finding blood where she never expected blood in her panties. So very important, everybody has to know at a certain age about menstruation. Another thing, everybody, all of the people who I talk to must know about nocturnal emission, about wet dreams, because there were mothers who were not sexually educated and who screamed at their son, what's the matter? How come you don't get up at night and go to the bathroom? How come you urinate in bed? He didn't urinate. He had nocturnal emission. He had a wet dream. So from now on, all over University of Washington, all over the Zoom world, everybody uh, has to know that we have to educate, we have to have a population of sexually literate people in order to avoid so many problems. I want to give you another example. Sigmund Freud was a famous, famous psychiatrist. He wrote many books about dreams. He was sexually illiterate. He should have taken a course with Pepper Schwartz or with me, because Sigmund Freud said, any woman who needs clitoral stimulation in order to have an orgasm, who does not, any woman who doesn't have a vaginal orgasm is an immature woman. That is nonsense. Every woman, the clitoris, is part of that sexual satisfaction and it's not a, we have to bury that myth that comes from old stories that a woman is only a mature woman if she has a vaginal orgasm so all of these things um menstruation and wet dreams and uh, uh, women uh, uh, the orgasmic response are all things that we can teach and that we can talk about, even to Seattle on on a Zoom. So as soon if Pepe gets on, I will ask her. In meantime, get me another question. Okay. Frost, Frost another question. 
Okay, sounds good, Dr. Riefel. Thank you. And yes, Pepper is, st we're still trying to get Pepper connected. Richard. She's having a little bit of technical difficulty. I know, I know. Get me another question. Here's a question that I have. We've been talking a lot about age. Are there different, is there different sex advice that you would give to people based upon the different cultures that they're from? Not if, well, first of all, I wrote a book, Sexuality in the Jewish Tradition, which just now became a classic NYU Press. And I am saying that in the Jewish tradition, it was very important to state that sex was never something not to be talked about. But they, of course, thought about sex in marriage. They didn't think about sex uh, outside of marriage. Uh, the advice that I give, for example, for older people, it's very important not to engage in sex at night when you are tired, but to engage in sex in the mornings. The couple get up in the morning, go to the bathroom, have a light breakfast. I used to say, hang the phone out so that the phone doesn't ring. We don't have to say that anymore. Put your computer, don't put the computer on. After a little breakfast, go back into bed. Uh, sex for older people is the best because it's easier for him to obtain an erection. And it's not true that women don't like sex in the morning. That's not so. They do like uh, sex after a good night's sleep with a partner whom they like and uh, enjoy. Another important lecture, an important lesson to be taught tonight, sex does not have to be simultaneous all the time. It's nice if it happens, he looks at her, she looks at him, they get aroused, they have sex. Sometimes she might want to have more sexual experiences than he. So I'm telling him, take a vibrator, give her an orgasm. If he wants to have more sexual activity than she does, I tell her, come here, I tell you a secret, even on Zoom. The secret is, give him an orgasm. It takes two minutes. What's the big deal? If he wakes up, has an erection, has had a little breakfast, back into bed, Give him an orgasm even if you don't feel like it. It doesn't have to be always simultaneous. And the reason that I can talk so openly is because I'm very well trained. I told you I worked with Helen Singer Kaplan for many years. And also, I get such pleasure out of hearing people say, you saved our sex life. So. Now I have to tell you something else. I get many people, Frost, can you hear me? I get, I get many people who say I saved their life because I was willing to talk about homosexuality when it was not popular. That was even before that terrible disease of AIDS. What I used to say is we do not know the etiology, that means the reason for homosexuality. But one thing is loud and clear, even in the year 2021, that respect is not debatable. We respect everybody and their choice of partners. Now, it's very important for me, sometimes, before the virus, when I went to a restaurant, here's what happened. A waiter said, Dr. Ruth, I have to talk to you before you leave here. I go to a corner. I don't ask his name. He said, you saved my life because I, was, I felt that I'm attracted to boys. You told me on the phone on your radio program, Sexually Speaking, you said, keep your mouth shut. Because I had told you, 
if I tell my parents, they're going to kick me out of the house. That was like maybe 30 years ago. I said, keep your mouth shut. It's nobody's business. Finish high school. Go to a college, a large population where there might be groups who are feeling exactly the way you are feeling. And guess what? That way they told me. He listened to me. He did not confront his family in those years. He went to a large university. I then said, then go to a large city. And here he is in New York City. And he told me I saved his life. When I think of this guy, I jump for joy. Because all I did was to say, your sexuality is nobody else's business. Don't confront. It's a different world right now. And make sure that you keep your mouth shut. I saved his life. Nice. Okay. First, another question. That's great, Dr. Ruth. Thank you so much for that. And, you know, speaking of, of you know, you're such a groundbreaker, like you just talked about, with the man who is, um, you know, your thoughts about homosexuality. We have a question from the audience, which is, my friends are in a polyamorous relationship and have mentioned feeling compar compersion. And I'm having trouble understanding that. Do you have any thoughts, Dr. Ruth, about compersion? Is it legitimate? Or how can I, you be happy for your partner if the relationships include emotional and physical intimacy with someone other than you? Okay, I have to tell you first, listen carefully. I'm old fashioned and a square. I know that there are people who have threesomes. Let them have a good time. I don't believe in it. Because I do know from working with so many couples that if that happens, somehow one of them is going to be a better lover. One of them is going to be jealous and it will end the relationship. So if somebody says, but I'm in the relationship with two other people, I say, have a good time. Next question. First, next question. Okay, so here's another question that we've got, and this is about 2020 specifically, because 2020 obviously has been fraught with so many different problems with the pandemic, with politics. Yes. So somebody, somebody in our audience wants to know, how do they get back in touch with their sexy side in such a crazy time? Okay, if I had an answer for that first, I would get a Nobel Prize. But I want to say something relationships that are basically good are going to survive. Relationships that have big problems might not. What one has to do is if you are in a relationship that can be salvaged, be so happy that you have a partner, that you are in a relationship, that you can count on that other person. For right now, things are very difficult because for people with problems it is very difficult because you are stuck at home and you don't go out and you don't do anything else. You have to keep your hope up. Look at me. An orphan at the age of ten and a half. My entire family killed by the Nazis and I'm an optimist and I say to people if you have a little bit of love and care and friendship for that partner that is with you, and that it holds true for heterosexual and for homosexual, for anybody, cultivate that relationship. Say, thank God I have somebody, even if I can fight with him or her from time to time. So this, this, um, a very important, you must keep your hope up and to know that that uh, epidemic is going to pass. And then maybe some relationships will break up. That's, that's okay. There's no law against um, relationships not surviving. Then there will be hopefully a new relationship. 
but the ones that can be salvaged. Make sure that you can salvage it and to be happy that that other person is there and you have that companionship in addition to raising the children and to uh, be together. Next question. Well, Dr. Oh. Ruth, that actually relates to another audience question that, that we had specifically about the pandemic. Yes. So this person is saying that they are in a relationship, but they feel bad when they actually complain to their single friends about the relationship they're in. Mm -hmm. So their question to you is how can they go about and um, talk about how insane their husband is making them feel without turning their single friends off? <laughs> First, listen carefully. Keep, tell them to keep their mouths shut, not to brag. I understand the question. It's a very serious, important question. And I'm telling you, keep your mouth shut. You don't have to tell them how many orgasms you had last night. And you don't have to tell them how, how you turn each other on. You can talk about some other stuff. Maybe you can be interested in recipes, talk about cooking, talk about something else and, and keep that intimate relationship for yourself and, and don't share it. <laughs> Next question. Okay, well, that's, that's, really good. that's really good advice. So here's another question that somebody's got, and this one is about um, their husband that wants to try a three-way. So this person said that she was shocked, one of our audience members. So what does that mean about him and their marriage? Okay, it doesn't have to mean anything, but it also could be that it's a little boring, always the same position, like the missionary position here on top, Maybe you have to learn some new positions. And I do advise, listen to me carefully. I'm not saying it doesn't exist. It exists. I do advise not to do it because relationships very often will not survive a threesome. Somehow, and also don't ever tell your partner that the last partner you had, uh, if it's, uh, you know, if the last partner had a bigger penis, size does not matter. And don't ever tell her that the last woman you were with had bigger breasts and you really like breasts because she will never forget that if she has small breasts. Sometimes it's better to keep your mouth shut and to use fantasy. Now, listen carefully. Don't use, uh, first, listen carefully. Don't use your next door neighbor in your fantasy. Not if it's a woman, not if it's a man. Because that's too near to it could happen in reality. Use somebody from television. I don't care who. Use any, any pop star. Use a singer. Use a football player anybody else that you can think of, but keep your mouth shut. Don't say, I'm now in bed with so-and-so. Now, you will tell me, sometimes there are people who like uh, to get aroused by fantasies of their partner. Use it. What I'm saying is careful because you don't want to offend somebody. You don't want to make somebody feel inadequate because people will then never forget that. Okay, you are very good. I'm giving you an A plus. Next question. Oh, thank you. Well, Dr. Ruth, this is, this is kind of relating to, to what you were just talking about with the fantasy. So somebody else, one of our other audience members, mm -hmm. emailed in and said that they just discovered that their partner is looking at porn a lot. Okay. And this person doesn't like porn for a lot of reasons. Mm -hmm. So they feel like that their partner is, is cheating on them. Right. So First, how can this person yeah, work through this? That's a wonderful question. And people that is not cheating, except if somebody can, if a man can never have an erection without looking, then I say, 
after the, uh, after the virus is cured, go and see a psychiatrist. But otherwise, looking from time to time at a sexually explicit uh, movie, no problem. Except you have to know that in those porno films, no actual men, in my experience of so many years of being a therapist, no man can have that kind of an erection like you see in the porno movies. And no woman can have this orgasm set jump so that she jumps up to the ceiling that you see in pornography. In pornography, everything is exaggerated. If some people need to see that pornographic movie in order to be aroused, use it. And after this epidemic is done, go and see a sex therapist or a psychiatrist and find out why you are hooked on these pornographic movies. If you just look at it from time to time, but make sure that no children are watching it with you. These days, very difficult with all of the uh, Zooms and all of the things, very difficult for parents to make sure. It's not for children. If he or she watches a little bit of it in order to not worry about income, about the rent, about all of those things, no problem. But if you are dependent on it, then after the virus is over, go and see a psychiatrist to discuss it of uh, what you can do. Because what, what's the most important thing is, if the relationship is a positive one, if you really like each other, make sure that you cultivate it. Make sure that you work at it so that it can be sustained. Next question. Well, that's, that brings up a good point. So if somebody is, if, if a couple is having um, issues of sex or part of the problems with the relationship, how do they actually go about finding a reputable sex therapist? And how do they know if they're a good fit or not? I, I would say that to find a sex therapist, the best thing to do would be to ask your physician friend, uh, that you see to recommend one. Uh, because it, sometimes you have to go and, you know what, sometimes the first person, the first sex therapist that you see might not be the right one. So you have to use your brain, you have to use your uh, knowledge by saying, uh, let me find the right person. Sometimes you might have to look at three people before you can find a psychosexual therapist that you can work with. And you have to be, you have to be aware of that. You can't, there are some people that you can't work with. And the same holds true for sex educators and sex therapists. If you find a couple that you just can't work with, you have to use a white lie. I'm all for white lies. You hear me? Frost, you have to use a white lie. You can't say, I can't work with you because you don't want to ruin their career. However, you can say, I'm so booked up for the next six months. I'm giving you three names of another sex therapist to work with you. Because sometimes a sex therapist sees a couple that they just can't work with. Then they have to know that comes with experience. They shouldn't just say, I can't work with you. That would be terrible. They should say, I am so booked up. That's a wide lie. Please, here are three names of somebody else. Okay, another question. Yes. So, um, would it help them to prize 
those who only see you as a preeminent sex expert. Something about your life. What would what would surprise the audience for people? First who of all, only... what would surprise you in Seattle is that I used to be a black diamond skier. I used to love to ski. No more. At the age of ninety-two and a half, I don't ski anymore. But some people would be surprised, and then other people would be surprised that I'm really, <laughs> I'm really old-fashioned and a square. Deep down, I'm really old-fashioned and a square. I believe in couples. I believe in people to be married, to raise their children, to enjoy their grandchildren. I have four of them. I have the best grandchildren in the world. And they would be surprised, but they should now go and watch the documentary on uh, on Hulu, and, um, and and maybe read a book because the last book, the Doctor is in, is a, a little bit autobiographical, and um, it tells a little about myself. And, and and you know what else they should be surprised? Somebody like you. First, you, if you were in my classroom now, you would get an A because you stepped in right away and you gave me good questions. So see if you can get a pepper, but don't lose me. Give me another question before you get pepper. What is the most harmful misconception about sex among the younger crowd. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I think I think Dr. Pepper Schwartz is going to agree with me that um, some younger people. <laughs> I don't ask you a personal question. You know that, but some younger people think <coughs> that they have the best sex. Other people don't have as good sex. I tell them, believe that. Stay with it. Okay, Pepe, you have a question. I can't hear her. So you have to go on. Oh, no, we're still, we're having trouble hearing you, Pepper. Uh, so get me another yeah. question. Okay. Well, here's a question for you. Do you ever get tired talking about sex? Never. <laughs> As you can see, late at night in New York, I never get tired. I, I think that tomorrow you are going to ask Pepper Schwartz, and I think she will agree with me that people like us get excited. I don't mean just sexually, uh, but uh, excited by being able to talk about those things on Zoom to 1,400 people at the University of Washington. Get me another question. Don't try again with the technical stuff. Go ahead. Okay, so well, what exactly is the Dr. Ruth position? <laughs> okay, the Dr. Ruth position is any sexual position that gives you pleasure. And it doesn't have to be at the same time. It can be he first, she first, he first, he first, whatever. Uh, to, uh, to, to women, whoever uh, first, it's very interesting what you're asking. You know why? I used to work at a human sexuality clinic that was specifically uh, on the west side of Manhattan and frequented by many men. Very few in those years, many years ago, very few lesbians came. And I always thought to myself, that's maybe because a woman knows better how to satisfy another woman. Um, I, I, don't, I still don't have an answer. I still need some research. Maybe the University of Washington will uh, see if that's still true in those years. It was mainly men. It was very often premature ejaculation, ejaculating 
faster than they want to, and other issues of jealousy and uh, and, and different uh, positions, but very few lesbians. That has changed now. So, but maybe um, maybe in those days it was uh, easier for women uh, to bring each other to uh, orgasm uh, than then uh, that maybe that's why they didn't have problems. Give me another question. Well, here's, okay, so speaking of the differences between men and women, we were talking about the G-spot before. <laughs> and does, does a I man have- I love that question. <laughs> yeah, so here's a question. Does a man have a G-spot too? I'm really curious about that. And if so, what's the best <laughs> okay, way to stimulate it? Okay, if you find a man with a G-spot, give me his name and phone number. I want to talk to him. Now, I, do you remember what I told you people? about three months ago, everybody in Seattle to read Cosmopolitan about the G-spot because I'm jumping for joy. It's not a scientifically validated data yet, but it is a very serious survey that stop looking for that G-spot. It might not exist. And Dr. Ruth for years has said Stop looking for something that might not even be there. Give me another question. So this person wrote in, one of our audience members wrote in, and they said, my partner has a higher libido than I do. Yes. I'm happy having sex once or twice a week, but they'd prefer to have sex daily. How do I keep up? Okay, like I told you before, if it's a man and if, and if she's a woman and they have that problem, the secret is, big deal, it takes two minutes, give him an orgasm. Don't have a discussion first. <clears throat> if it is two men, give the other guy a blowjob. Go down on him, have oral sex, do whatever is needed so that you can get some sleep. The, the important thing is, it is not important to have that simultaneous. If it happens, enjoy it but don't don't make your life miserable because you're waiting for that simultaneous uh, uh, orgasm i have to give me one more okay so speaking of ex expectations so one of our audience members found a prescription for erectile dysfunction prescription in their partner's bag that was filled months ago but he never brought it up to this person Mm -hmm. So should the audience member ask them about it? No. Keep your mouth no. shut. And if there is a question that it's more difficult to obtain or maintain the erection, let that person work it out. Do not confront. Don't say, I found that in your pocket. Keep your mouth shut. Not everything, even a very loving, relationship and a wonderful uh, talking, not, uh, not everything has to be told. I also believe not everything, Frost, do you hear me? Yeah. Not everything in your past has to be shared. And if you have a partner right now, count yourself lucky that you don't have to be lonely because that issue of loneliness right now is very serious because people are stuck in their apartments. And uh, I'm lucky I talked to 1,400 people. Next time, I make sure that Pepe Schwartz is, uh, tell her that her microphone works. <laughs> I know Pepe for many years. She was on my television program on Lifetime, and now she's on Lifetime. So another time, you people make sure that her microphone works. In meantime, wonderful, you stepped right in A+. plus. Do we have time for one more question? Yeah, we do. Good. So this this person, thank you for that. For, thank you for that compliment. And yes, next time, definitely we need to get Dr. Pepper Schwartz back. But do you have any tips for somebody when they're buying their first vibrator? Okay. First of all, uh, 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 the, a vibrator helps uh, women, particularly 
who need a longer time to be sexually aroused. I sometimes tell women, if it takes a long time and he doesn't have the patience, use that vibrator and get yourself very aroused. Some women need a vibrator in, in terms of actually uh, having an orgasm. It, uh, the, the vibrator is not going to be your lover. The vibrator can't talk, so he should not be jealous. If you are free enough to, you, to let him use it, then do that. If not, go to the bathroom. Put on the water. Let the water run. Then he doesn't even hear that you are using the vibrator. And use the vibrator to get very aroused and then let him bring you to orgasm. Try that and then you call Frost and you tell him if it worked and he'll call me. <laughs> That's great. Thank you so much, Dr. Ruth. And we, and, you know, thank you so much for your time mm -hmm. and this, you know, giving all this advice. You've been giving advice for many years. You know, many of us have grown up with you. So this is just a tremendous opportunity. We're so grateful to have you here. And we apologize to to Dr. Pepper Schwartz too for the technical difficulties we ran into. And we have time for just one more question. Okay. And, and this kind of brings it back to talking about the um, pandemic. Mm -hmm. What are some great ways that you, Dr. Ruth, would, would suggest, what kind of advice would you give to our viewers of how they can date during this pandemic? How can they have what? How to date during the pandemic. Very difficult. And guess what? I have made my entire career, I have always been very honest. When I don't know an answer, I say, I do not know. And this is a, that's the type of question, Frost, that I don't have an answer. Because I would worry about dating places, I would worry about who did get vaccinated and who did not. So I want to end this. Next time I'll talk to Peppa when her microphone works. And I want to tell you, thank you. Please become sexually literate and please be careful. And let's all hope that this epidemic is going to be over and then i'm going to do another program with pepper schwartz thank you all so very much bravo to your questions thank you so much dr ruth you and were thank brilliant you. thank you thank you so much and who thank pay, you especially pay, who pays your salary i want <laughs> you to get a tip <laughs> that's great thank you thank you so much dr ruth and a special special thank you to to dr pepper schwartz right. who thank you, we pepper. are yes thank you so much pepper and thank you dr ruth you've all been great and have a wonderful night thank good you. night good night yes thank you miriam westheimer